I think is pretty important for the general public to know, and I'll get into that. Disclaimer. I am certified for both CPR and AED usage twice over and been through several classes and I do have a lot of hands-on experience, but this is not a substitute for formalized training in an environment with experience and uh, people who teach it for a living, okay? So I don't take responsibility for if you do any of the stuff I tell you to do. I think it's important that you know it, but I strongly suggest that you get actual training uh, you can get training through uh, organizations like the Red Cross and the American Heart Associations. Sometimes fire departments will also hold, uh, hold classes for their communities, and sometimes community centers will hold events like that as well. So, why should you care about CPR? Uh, CPR is, uh, I just lost my train of thought. During a cardiac crisis, Time is crucial, and every minute, uh, chances of recovery decrease by about 10%. Every, uh, even the best emergency medical responses take like somewhere around five minutes, even if you live very close to them. And you know, uh, that, those are minutes that you can go down by about 50% in survival rates. Um, CPR is only initiated by bystanders about 40% of the time which means that over half of all heart attacks are, um, they don't have the best outcome that they could have had. Uh, and even more important than that, 74% of uh, cardiac arrests occur within the home, which means that more than likely, if somebody has a heart attack, they're gonna be around family and friends. So knowing how to do CPR before that happens is kind of critical. You don't want to learn it under live fire by like looking it up when you need to be doing it or learning over the phone. It's a very uncomfortable situation that I've been in before. <laughs> so knowledge beforehand is key. So safety and communication and consent. Always check your environment whenever there's somebody that you think is having an emergency. Uh, if somebody's like in a room that's full of CO2 or gas, you don't want to go in and become another problem, uh, another casualty that has to be taken care of. Um, if it's not safe, even though you want to be the hero, don't be the hero, don't be another problem. Uh, you should consider wearing protective equipment if you're going to be treating a stranger or even your own family members, you would know them. Uh, use your better judgment, such as a breathing barrier, which, oh, sorry, I gave that to you in more time. Uh, use a breathing barrier, use nitrile gloves, stuff like that to avoid getting any substances on yourself. You know, protect your own health first and foremost. Um, during an emergency, uh, you need to have clear communications with other bystanders and be uh, clear. This usually comes in instead of just saying, somebody call 911, look directly at a person, say, you call 911. And, you know, that. Uh, so a lot of people worry that if they do CPR or if they get their hands on something uh, in one of those emergency scenarios, they'll be held legally liable. There is legal protection for if you find an unconscious person, uh, it's called implied consent. If you have implied consent, it means that this person isn't responding and they uh, are having a cardiac emergency, it's assumed by the law that they want you to help them. Uh, and the Good Samaritan Law states directly, a person who in good faith renders emergency care or assistance without compensation shall not be liable for any civil damages for acts or omissions occurring at the place of an emergency or accident while the person is in transit to or from the emergency or accident while the person is being moved to or from an emergency shelter unless such acts or omissions constitute recklessness or willful and wanton misconduct. Just use common sense, try to respect them while also helping them. Leading to CPR, scene safety, like I said, make sure that you don't become another casualty. Uh, check their awareness, pulse, and breathing. So like, shake their shoulders, try to like verbalize, see if they can respond. I've had people who are, at least one person who is just asleep in public, and I'm like, my bad. Um, so you want to check their pulse, their carotid pulse, you can find it on your neck. Um, 
pulse. I thought. And if they don't have a pulse and they're not breathing, you're good to start CPR. You want to lay them on their back. Uh, you want to call 911 and retrieve resources. If you just find somebody in public, call 911. Even people who are trained emergency responders, if they're not like on job, they want like an ambulance there. And begin quality CPR as soon as you have, uh, as soon as you've called 911, sent bystanders to call 911, or gotten first aid kits, AEDs, etc. How to give quality CPR. Make sure that the patient has their back against a hard and flat surface. Position yourself adjacent to their torso. Uh, lock your shoulders and arms because you want to push with the whole weight of your torso onto them. Lace your fingers like this so both of your arms are going uh, in at a time. Uh, you'll want to compress their sternum by 2, point, uh, two inches to 2.4 inches. Use all of your weight. Um, some people are concerned they might break the sternum. If you're giving someone CPR, it doesn't get worse than being dead. So, like, don't worry about it. Uh, compress at a rate of about 100 to 120, which means you can do it to the beat of staying alive. <laughs> um, when you do a compression, allow it to come all the way back up. If you just keep pushing down, it's not letting blood enter back into the heart. So, you'll just kill them. They'll just still die. Do that, do 30 compressions in a cycle, followed by um, breaths. When you're giving a breath, you want to do something called a head tilt chin lift or a jaw thrust. You want to use a jaw thrust if you think that their neck might have suffered a lot of trauma because you don't want to uh, sever their spinal cord by moving their head. Um, I, there's a picture right there. Uh, you can look it up online, it's really easy to do. Uh, Seal the airway by pinching the nose or using a CPR mask. I'd pass that around somewhere. Um, give breaths, just breathe fully into them uh, once you've sealed it. Ensure that their chest is rising and falling. Look at their chest, make sure it goes up and then back down. And then give them a second full breath. And then you wanna start the next cycle of compressions. And you continue doing that until you can't or you become unsafe. If the chest is not rising, uh, if the chest isn't rising, posit, try to reposition the head, examine the seal, or consider that something might be lodged in their throat. All right, an AED. What is an AED? An AED is an automated external defibrillator. Um, it's really easy to use. What it effectively does is just shocks the heart back into a good rhythm. Uh, it increases the chance of survival by like 70%. I'm gonna go over time a little bit because I just wanna finish up with the AED here. Uh, uh, three times the survival rate than just doing uh, CPR. If you just do CPR, you have about a 9% survival rate. If you give them an AED, it's about 37%. So you definitely want to use an AED if it's available. Where are they? They're pretty expensive, so you'll usually find them in public. If you go out the hall, out into the hall and like turn right, I believe that there's just one right there, there down the hall. You want to use one whenever there's a cardiac emergency, so just send somebody else. If you're in public, there's usually a bystander. Get somebody to go get one while you start doing compressions. All right, how to use an AED. Do CPR until the AED arrives. If you're alone, go get the AED. Like I said, increases the chances of survival. Uh, remove obstructions like clothing, chest hair, and dry them off if they're in water. Water is very bad for electricity being in the picture. Apply the AED as pictured. Almost all of the AEDs have images on the pads on where to put them. Usually it's right here on the right chest and lower left. Um, if they overlap because the patient is small, you can do it on the front and back. That's also how you do it with kids. Um, uh, once you turn it on and plug the pads in, it will analyze and it will tell you everything to do. It'll say, don't touch the patient while it analyzes the heart rate. You should shout clear to make sure nobody's touching it. It will tell you either to shock or don't shock. If you are going to shock, make sure no one's touching it because if somebody is touching the patient while you use an AED, their heart can stop and then you have two people who are now, you know, medically dead. So don't do that. After it shocks, immediately resume doing CPR. Um, what to do after you do CPR? 
hand it off, hand off to EMS, do what you can to help them, keep bystanders away, uh, don't get in their way, don't like try to get in the middle, they know what to do like a lot more. Um, give details and times like when you found them and when uh, you think that they became unconscious when you used an AED. Do what they tell you to do because they may require you to help do something. And answer their questions to the best of your abilities. Um, mental health. CPR can be traumatic regardless of if the patient lives or dies. And there's no shame in feeling, you know, uh, hurt afterwards. There's no shame in trying to find help after a CPR event. And one of the most important ones is that the outcome isn't on you. If you try to help and they don't make it, sometimes you can do everything right and it just doesn't work. All right. Once again, get certified, strongly recommend it. You can feel more confident in your abilities. If somebody in your family happens to have a cardiac arrest, you wanna be trained and knowledgeable, have that practical hands-on experience. American Red Cross, American Heart Association, fire departments, look it up, get certified. It takes like a single afternoon on a Saturday. That's my speech.